Видно? Не видно. Доску? Не очень. Мне это видно, а я не знаю. Издалека видно доску? Ничего, надо на пол успокоить, написать букву и спросить, что за букву? Нет, вы не, не говорите, а какая? Или он начальник. Видно? Будет ворот. Одна половина вашего мозга видит экран, а вторая доску. So good morning everybody. We start lectures on cosmology, so from urology to cosmology. All right, good morning. Uh, nice to be here again. So uh, the topic of these lectures is going to be standard cosmological model. And uh, in the first place, the question is, what is the standard cosmological model? Uh, In spirit, it's uh, similar to uh, the, the standard model of particle physics in the sense that this is the minimal model which uh, describes our universe. It's surprisingly simple in some sense and uh, it can be divided into two parts. One is uh, what can be called homogeneous universe the properties of the universe uh, which are seen at the level of uh, homogeneous and isotropic universe and uh, the main ingredients here are uh, all kinds of matter and, and energy that exists in our universe, baryonic matter, neutrinos, they are relatively important, to some extent they are important as well. The most important thing, things are dark matter and dark energy. Now, uh, specifically, if one talks about the standard model, then uh, one goes to uh, minimum assumptions, and the minimum assumptions are uh, that the dark matter is cold, that dark energy is time independent, it's just a constant, and uh, another thing is that there's no spatial curvature. We'll be talking about the special curvature later on, but uh, the assumption is that our universe is Euclidean in space, three-dimensional space is Euclidean. The second part has to do with inhomogeneities in the universe. Of course, the universe is not exactly homogeneous. There are all kinds of structures, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, small structures, are all cells. So uh, the Other ingredient is perturbations. Uh, namely, we will see that perturbations are primordial. They were built in at the very early stage of the evolution of the universe. So one can ask what are the properties of these primordial perturbations. And again, the minimum assumption is that uh, there are only scalar perturbations. Uh, these perturbations are adiabatic We will be talking about uh, meaning of these words at these lectures. They are Gaussian, again, a simple possible assumption concerning the random field of perturbations, that is that they are Gaussian. And furthermore, uh, any Gaussian field is completely characterized by its power spectrum. If there is no anisotropy or uh, other exotic properties, then uh, in homogeneity in Bollage, then uh, it can be characterized by, by the power law. And uh, the simplest assumption is that this power law, uh, this power spectrum, sorry, this power, the power spectrum is uh, of power law form like this. Okay. Here, K star is some matter of convention, it's just a matter of choice. Uh, and the important things are the amplitude here and the spectral index. So, there are rather few parameters that 
characterize this minimalistic model, the standard model of cosmology. Namely, uh, the parameters one has to learn are barium mass density, including electrons, uh, dark matter mass density, and let me also mention that uh, there are different uh, notations in literature. For example, this power spectrum is often denoted in this form. Uh, however, in other papers you can see another form with uh, uh, script R here or delta square. That's the, another notation for the amplitude. So if you read cosmological papers, be aware that notations vary from paper to paper. And also this, uh, uh, the, the uh, normalization uh, momentum here, or wave vector, is sometimes denoted in, in another way, with k0. But anyway, so uh, therefore here as well, the uh, dark matter mass density uh, is sometimes denoted in this way, dark energy density in this way. Anyway. We want to know the baryonic mass density, dark matter mass density, and dark energy density. That's essentially all that we need to characterize our universe. Uh, it's homogeneous uh, properties. Inhomogeneities, as I said, are characterized by the scalar amplitude and scalar spectral energy. So there are only five parameters here which uh, which characterize our universe, if we think in the minimalistic manner. Uh, also, there are other parameters which play some role in the universe, namely neutrino masses. Uh, since neutrinos are there in the universe, we need to know their masses to uh, calculate precisely the properties of our universe. And another thing which often uh, Used, is often used to parameterize the data is what's called redshift of reionization. Uh, reionization is an epoch in the universe, some few hundred million years after the Big Bang, when uh, the first stars and first dwarf galaxies started to form, and uh, uh, due to these uh, energetic processes, the uh, gas which existed at that time in the universe, became ionized again. And uh, in principle, once we know all these parameters, uh, this epoch is calculable. The time at which this happened is calculable. However, uh, it's really very difficult, if possible at all, to calculate this uh, time, this epoch, and therefore, uh, this redshift of reionization is used as a free parameter when one parameterizes the data. So that's it. That's all uh, parameters that are needed to describe our universe. And surprisingly, all we know, uh, everything we know about our universe is consistent with this simple picture. And uh, as I will be discussing during these lectures, we know a lot, actually. Uh, about the, our universe and to reasonable precision, still uh, this simplest version, standard cosmological model, describes all the data surprisingly well. Okay, so what do we physicists want to know about our universe? Well, uh, we want to know its present status its expansion rate, we know that the universe expands, so we want to know the expansion rate. We want to know composition of our universe, uh, baryons, dark matter, dark energy. We want to know spatial curvature. And uh, it's also useful to know some properties of structures in the universe. Now, if we talk about recent universe, then we want to know how did it expand in the past, what was the expansion rate as a function of time. If we go to early universe, again, we would like to know expansion rate at very early times. In particular, we want to know whether 
uh, general relativity works uh, at early epochs. And also, we want to know origin of composition of our universe, origin of dark matter, origin of baryons, but that's, that's what I'm not going to talk about in this lecture. Finally, if we go to very early universe, then we want to know uh, whether there was an epoch preceding the hot Big Bang stage of cosmological evolution. And that's a very intriguing question. We know there was a hot stage. However, we would like to know if it was the first stage or uh, whether there was some other epoch, for example, in inflation, that was preceding the hot, hot stage. And uh, if so, what was the property, what were the properties of this uh, very early epoch? In particular, we want to know how these uh, initial perturbations, primordial perturbations, were generated. And again, surprisingly, we have some clues on this very early epoch, and that's part of my lectures. Uh, if we talk about the origin of composition, of origin of dark matter, origin of baryons, that's of course particle physics that, uh, that works there. And also, if we talk about inflation or some other epoch preceding the hot big bang stage, then uh, it's again physics of essentially particle physics or high energy physics, but at very high energy speed. So all that is interesting from the high energy physics point of view. Okay, so let's proceed. And to set the stage, let me write down a few formulae. Uh, first of all, our present universe is homogeneous and isotropic at large scales. We're talking about scales of exceeding 200 megaparsec or so. And let me mention that megaparsec, one megaparsec, is uh, 3 million light years, which is 3 times 10 to 24. Thinking. That's the scale used in cosmology, and the reason why it is used is that uh, the scale of a few megaparsec is, a, is, the, is the size of uh, cluster of galaxies. So we're talking about megaparsecs or tens of megaparsecs, that's the largest structures that exist in the universe. If you go to 200 megaparsec and higher, then, and larger than the universe is, is homogeneous and isotropic. Even this is a matter of debate, though, because now from time to time there appear claims that there are structures bigger than uh, a couple of hundred megaparsec. If so, that would be extremely interesting because that would be uh, contradicting the, uh, the standard cosmological model. But for the time being, the issue is still unclear and uh, still we can think of our universe as homogeneous and isotropic at two, three hundred megaparsec scale and above. Now our universe is expanding, that means that the interval in our universe is, of course, contains the time part, but also it has uh, the spatial part that extends. Okay, so uh, x are co-moving coordinates, and essentially the distant galaxies sit at fixed value of co-moving coordinate x, and a of t is a scale factor. It increases so that the space is stretching out. Uh, so essentially, when we're talking about the expansion of the universe, we want to know how this scale factor changes with time. Okay? And uh, the array of this chain is the uh, ratio of a dot over a, which is called Hubble parameter, which t, it depends on time, 
and its present value is conveniently denoted by H0. H0 is the Hubble parameter. And since the universe uh, expands, the space stretches out, the wavelength of, of a photon also uh, increases in time. So if one uh, emits a photon at some time t emission with wavelength around the emission, then today the wavelength of this photon will be longer because the space has stretched out and it will be equal to the ratio of the scale factor today not is always today a naught over a of time of emission times the uh, wavelength of emission okay and this thing, this factor, this ratio is called 1 plus z, and z is the redshift. So, uh, uh, so instead of time, we can think of redshift as measuring the uh, how far in the past uh, this photon was emitted. Okay. Now, redshift is directly measurable because uh, the emission. Wavelength is determined by conventional physics, <coughs> conventional physics, atomic physics, and uh, the uh, wavelength that we actually measure is a measurable quantity. So redshift is measurable pretty well by looking at the ah, okay. that's the outline of my lecture. So today we'll be talking about homogeneous universe tomorrow about inhomogeneities and CMB and isotropies and uh, the third lecture will be on the study. So let's uh, come back to photons. Uh, one measures this, this spectra, for example, absorption spectra in this case of galaxies, of distant galaxies. One identifies the lines in this absorption spectra and in this way one measures Redshift because these lines are actually shifted to a longer wavelength as compared to the real lines of, in this case, uh, iron. Okay? So one measures the redshift for distant objects, like here, it's more difficult, as you see, to identify the lines. But still, even at large redshifts, if one has enough photons, if one has bright enough source, then one can measure the redshift. Uh, now, at small distances, uh, one can expand this, this thing. If we talk about not very distant sources, then one can expand A naught over A of T emission uh, like this. This is A naught. In the denominator, you have A naught plus minus A dot at present time T naught minus T. Right? This is valid if we are talking about relatively nearby source, so that the distance is not very large. The time uh, between the mission and uh, today is not very large. Then one can expand this and get that this is equal to 1 plus a dot over a to the times the uh, difference in times. And this difference is equal to the distance to the source. I set c and h equal to 1. So this time is equal to the distance to the source. And in this way we get to the uh, Hubble law that tells us that the redshift z is equal to h naught times r. So uh, the redshift is linearly proportional to the distance, and that's called Hubble law. With uh, the coefficient here is the present value of the Hubble. Law. And this way, <coughs> one tries to measure the Hubble uh, the present value of the Hubble parameter, present expansion rate in the universe. And uh, 
it's not very difficult to convince oneself that there is indeed linear relation between the between this uh, uh, between the redshift z and the uh, luminosity essentially. That's a funny thing that, that's called uh, magnitude, but that's essentially logarithm of the distance. Uh, so there is a linear relation. The problem with uh, the determination of the Hubble parameter is that one needs to know uh, the actual distance to the source. And clearly, if the source is far away, and we're talking about hundreds of megaparsecs or so, even more, then of course it's not clear how you can really infer the or determine precisely the distance to the source. That's big business, and uh, therefore systematic errors here are uh, even difficult to estimate. Uh, that's another uh, example of the linear relationship between the uh, redshift and uh, magnitude, or uh, this is logarithmic plot. Anyway, uh, the uh, direct determination of the Hubble parameter varied from uh, one author to another precisely because of this uh, uh, systematic uncertainty. So this is the estimate uh, from the session uh, obtained from this kind of plot. Uh, and the estimate which is obtained by fitting all cosmological data together uh, gives similar point. And notice that today the claim is that the uh, uh, error bar is pretty small. Now, uh, let me point out this funny unit. Uh, unit is kilometer per second per megaparsec, although clearly this H0 has the uh, dimension of inverse distance, that is the dimension less, of course, and uh, H0 has uh, the dimension of inverse distance. That's a matter of uh, history, because one tries to interpret this relationship, the left-hand side, as the velocity, and uh, this relationship as the relationship between the velocity of outgoing matter, or galaxy and distance to this galaxy. Because that, that is, can be interpreted as the, uh, do, uh, as the Doppler effect. So therefore, one measures this Hubble parameter traditionally, historically, in units of velocity over distance. Okay. But physically, uh, this is of course the uh, inverse time or inverse uh, distance and uh, and the in physical units the Hubble parameter is approximately inverse that's the characteristic time it's approximately 1.4 or 14 billion years which is accidentally the same essentially as the age of the universe which is 13.7 billion years. That's an accident. It's not, there is no straightforward relationship between the Hubble parameter, the present value of the Hubble parameter, and uh, the lifetime of the universe. But accidentally, they are the same. OK. So one measures the Hubble parameter. Uh, and then one starts to write formulae. The most relevant formula for a homogeneous universe is uh, the Friedman equation. The Friedman equation relates the Hubble parameter at certain time to the energy density, 8 pi over 3 g, g is the Newton's constant, rho, rho is the energy density. Jimmy, you want to draw? Here it is. 
minus kappa over a squared. Now, what is this term? Uh, in principle, homogeneous and isotropic universe could be uh, Euclidean space. Could be Euclidean, like uh, three-dimensional analog of plane, but it can also be three-dimensional sphere or uh, hyperboloid. Okay? There are three kinds of homogeneous and isotropic spaces, and kappa it is just the uh, characteristic of this space, so that it's equal to plus one for three sphere, minus one for three hyperboloid, and zero for Euclidean space. So depending on whether we are dealing with an A for three sphere and three hyperboloid can also be interpreted as the uh, radius of curvature. So in the case of three-dimensional sphere, it's just a radius of the sphere. So there is a contribution to the expansion rate due to, in principle, uh, due to curvature of space, of three-dimensional space. Okay? Now, I mentioned these parameters omegas, and they are defined in the following fashion. One defines the critical energy density. By definition, this is the energy density that produces uh, our value, present value of the Hall parameter without spatial curvature. So, by definition, present value of the Hall parameter equals to 8 pi over 3 g times log critical. That's the definition of critical. That's uh, energy density. If you know the Hubble parameter, you know the value of this critical energy density. And this critical energy density in our universe is, uh, in physical units, is 5 times 10 to the minus 6 GeV per centimeter cube. Or 5 GeV per cubic meter. Our universe is pretty empty, right? All energy in our universe is just five protons per cubic meter. Five proton masses per cubic meter. So, omegas, the definition is that for any kind of matter I, one introduces the ratio of its actual energy density over this critical energy. That's the definition of omega. Omega is always meant to describe our present universe, the composition of our present universe. Okay? But also, immediately introduces omega related to curvature, <coughs> kappa, which is the contribution, relative contribution of this uh, curvature term to the Hubble parameter. And this is minus kappa over a squared not 1 over h naught squared. Okay. So, essentially, if one interprets this as the contribution of some matter, some energy density, then this omega kappa is uh, the same thing as for other kinds of energy density. Okay? So, we want to know all these omegas. And, uh, in particular, different components in the universe contribute differently to the uh, to the Friedman equation at different times. Okay. I'm sorry. In yes. What sense is critical density critical? What's it critical? is critical in the following sense: if the energy density of all kinds of matter today equals critical energy density, then our space, three-dimensional space, is Euclidean. This term is absent. Okay. If rho is equal to critical rho, then this term is absent, meaning that we have Euclidean uh, three-dimensional space. So it's on the bottom line between three sphere and three hyperbola. Okay. That's why it's called critical. Now, from the uh, gravitational viewpoint, different kinds of matter 
or clean energy behave differently depending on whether this matter is non-relativistic, relativistic, or it is dark energy. So, matter, which is both baryons and dark matter, the energy density of matter in the past was, of course, proportional to parent energy density, but uh, it was different. It gets diluted like gold. Okay, so uh, it goes like one over a cube. So it decreases like volume, right? Simply because uh, for non-relativistic matter, it, the energy density is the mass of particles, and therefore, if the universe expands, the number density of these particles decreases. Uh, proportionally to inverse volume, and therefore the energy density decreases in the same way. Now, the different thing is radiation. Okay? Radiation meaning photons and uh, until pretty recently neutrinos as well. They were ultra relativistic until quite recently. And for these species, <coughs> the behavior is different because not only the number density of photons decreases uh, proportionally to, to, to inverse volume, but also the wavelength increases or frequency decreases inversely proportional to the size. Okay? Frequency goes like 1 over a. Uh, wavelength increases like a, like the scale factor. The, the frequency decreases in this fashion, and therefore the energy density goes like a naught to a in the fourth power. Uh, matter present or radiation present. Okay. And also the dark energy. behaves differently, our working assumption is that its energy density doesn't change in time at all. So these three species, these three parts of energy, contribute differently to the Friedman equation here, because you understand that the uh, dark energy is relevant today, but early on, the matter energy density was much higher than the dark energy density. And even earlier, radiation energy density was dominant. So, sequence of events is that we start from some early stage, inflation, possibly, then we go to radiation domination, Matter domination and Lambda domination. Dark energy is often known by Lambda. Okay. So today we are at the stage when the dark dark energy started has started to dominate. Not not quite yet, but nearly. But pretty recently, matter was dominant. Okay. So. Uh, neutrinos are actually special because uh, until rather recently they contributed to radiation and now they contribute to matter. So, what is the distribution between these species? Okay, so we have ordinary matter and that's pretty small fraction, 4.7% of all energy. Actually, uh, luminous stars are even smaller fraction. Most of this is the ionized gas in uh, clusters of galaxies. Neutrinos, it's not clear how much do they contribute because we don't know neutrino masses, but their contribution is within 1%. Most of things, most of energy density today is dark matter and dark energy. 24%, 71%. 
So if we uh, think of different epochs, early on there was possibly inflation or some other stage. Then there was radiation domination. When temperature in the universe was about 9,000 Kelvin, uh, radiation domination changed into, changed into matter domination. That occurred after about 60,000 years after the Big Bang. Pretty recently, at redshift about 4.7, uh, the uh, dark energy started to play a role. And today, it contributes 70%. Okay, so uh, clearly, since we uh, since we know how all these species behave in time or with the redshift, we can actually measure this uh, composition, especially matter to dark energy relation, by using this Friedman equation. Let me rewrite this Friedman equation in convenient form. Which is quite suggestive. Namely, we can rewrite this identically as H squared equals to H naught squared. Okay. And then we have different contribution of different kinds of energy. Omega dark energy which is a constant, plus omega meta A over A naught cube. And remember, A over A naught is, oh, sorry, A naught over A. And this is 1 plus Z cubed, right? Plus omega radiation, A naught over A, the fourth part. So, if one and curvature, which I kind of omitted here, and in fact, curvature is very small today, if any. That's my metaphor. So, I forget about this curvature term. I may actually write it here as well. Plus omega curvature times A naught over A squared. <coughs> Let me. Keep it for a time. So what can think, if one can measure this Hubble rate at different redshifts, then one can see what the uh, relationship between different forms of matter or di different forms of, of energy is. Okay. There are several ways to measure the uh, composition of the universe. For example, one can uh, try to measure the distance uh, to the source, okay, as a function of redshift. So uh, one way to, to measure the uh, essentially Hubble rate is to measure the distance redshift relations. Okay. Namely, <coughs> we know that light travels with the speed of light, right? So with the metric written on this blackboard, we know that uh, the coordinate distance traveled by light times a equals to dt, right? That's the how the light travels through the universe. So the coordinate distance that light travels from time t to today is given by dt over T, that's the coordinate distance. And physical distance is R equals to A naught, the present value of the scale factor times this coordinate distance, T to T0, T over T. And then one can use the definition of the Hubble parameter to rewrite this as an integral over the redshift from 0 to z h of z. Okay? 
that's a kind of trivial transformation of this integral <coughs> from <coughs> time to redshift using uh, the definition of the redshift. And therefore, if we measure the, uh, the distance to the source as function of its redshift, then we know the integra integral her integrated characteristic of the uh, Hubble parameter, or in other words, you can rewrite this as 1 over h naught integral from time to the present time for z 0 to z 1 and this square root of omega z energy plus 1 plus z cube from the matter plus other terms right? that's that's the, the Hubble parameter written on this, on that diagram. Okay? So, if we measure the distance as function of redshift, then we can, can measure the uh, matter and uh, dark energy contribution separately into the composition of the universe. Okay? So, oops, ah. So, the distance redshift relation for different uh, compositions of the universe is shown here, right? Uh, this black curve corresponds to more or less the present composition of the universe. Uh, this curve would be the uh, redshift distance relation for matter-dominated universe without any dark energy. And here, this would be the redshift distance relation for the universe in which matter is more or less what we know today, but the rest in the couple in the in the Friedman equation is dominated by the uh, curvature. In fact, uh, this model with the curved universe, this one, was rather popular in the 90s, in uh, because. We knew at that time that uh, the, uh, from uh, astrophysical data, we knew the uh, matter content in our universe. We knew that there was dark, dark, dark matter. Dark matter is a long story. It was uh, clear in the mid-80s, at least, that there is dark matter in the universe from astrophysical uh, Observations like rotation curves of galaxies, this is the velocity uh, of distant stars surrounding the galaxy as a function of distance from this galaxy. And if everything was concentrating in here, where the luminous matter is, then one would expect this kind of curve decaying because uh, it's just a Newton's law. However, the actual rotation curves go in a completely different fashion so that there is a lot of matter in here, in the galactic halo, and this is dark matter. Even more striking are data on uh, clusters of galaxies, including, like shown here, here gravitational lensing, which enables one to infer the uh, gravitational potential uh, by looking how the uh, light rays uh, get attracted by this uh, by this cluster of galaxies. Here, here are the uh, blue are the images of the galaxy behind this cluster. Okay, and looking at these images, one figures out the dark matter distribution in these clusters of galaxies and the entire uh, <coughs> uh, mass to light ratio in the cluster of galaxies. And from that. Even in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, it was clear that uh, matter in the universe was not very abundant, that uh, it was like 20 to 30 percent of energy density sitting in, in matter, in dark matter in particular, and in baryons. So this uh, model with a uh, curved universe was, uh, at that time, it was a rather uh, 
it, it, that was more or less the standard cosmological model. So like, the standard model, unlike particle physics, in particle physics, has changed since mid uh, 90s till today. Uh, at that time, it was uh, the Curd universe model. Uh, but in any case, both dark, ma dark energy dominated universe and Curd universe models are very unnatural. Again, the situation is similar to uh, the standard model of particle physics because this term here started to dominate very recently, or in the curved case, this term here started to dominate very recently. That's a very unnatural thing, because in the early times, these were completely negligible, and yet they are there. So there was a choice between dark energy and curvature, which was resolved when people started to look at uh, supernova as uh, standard candles and started to measure redshift distance relation for these standard candles. These are early uh, supernova data and uh, one has to, you know, to be very brave to figure out that in fact we are dealing with uh, uh, redshift distance relation characteristic of dark energy dominated universe as compared to the uh, Curvature dominated universe, which in this plot would be uh, the, the uh, straight line here. So that's Nobel Prize. Okay, this increase, little increase in or in magnitude or uh, decrease in luminosity, uh, was claimed to show that there was dark energy. There is dark energy in the universe, which was in the end true. Today, supernova data are a lot more precise, so one, uh, there, there are hundreds of supernova observed, and uh, uh, now we are pretty confident that we are dealing with uh, uh, dark energy dominated, dominated universe from these data only. Okay, so. Now, the, actually, this is not the only uh, astrophysical determination of the uh, dark energy density. Another has to deal with, again, with the fact that if you have dark energy, then the universe expands uh, rather fast, right? This is a constant term, and uh, it, it expands essentially exponentially. Not yet, but uh, al almost exponentially today, right? So, uh, because of that, one, one effect is that uh, the uh, structures in the, in the universe that are formed today, or very recently, actually grow uh, slower than in, say, matter-dominated universe, or curvature-dominated universe. So by looking at the, uh, by, by counting clusters, one can also, oh, okay, th that's the plot showing the Re uh, recent data on supernova only. Here is the uh, omega meta, here is omega lambda, the uh, dark energy density, and that's the allowed regions by supernova data only. And uh, in combination with other data, even, even these data themselves tell you uh, unambiguously that uh, we are dominated by dark, dark energy, but we combination with other cosmological data show this even more uh, clear. So this is cluster uh, this, uh This is the cluster count at uh, present, the number of clusters as function of their mass. Here is the mass uh, in units of solar masses, essentially. These are big clusters, like right? 10 to the 15 solar masses. These are big, big clusters of galaxies. Uh, and they get formed very recently, today, essentially. And you see, if we are talking about smaller, uh, uh, some uh, well, relatively large redshift, like 0.5 or 0.9, then there are a lot less clusters there, which tells you that clusters are actually, these big clusters are actually formed today. Uh, and counting these clusters is consistent with the lambda CDM model, with the uh, 
dark energy dominated universe. Whereas if you think of curvature dominated universe like here, you get badly wrong. Okay, so this again unambiguously shows that we are living in a dark energy dominated universe. Clusters uh, grow much slower than, than they would uh, the, the grow in the in the uh, method dominant Now, there is one more method which is quite nice and very powerful in some respect. And this has to do with what is called baryon acoustic oscillations. That's probably the last thing I'm going to tell you today. Um, the point is that uh, we have relic photons, we know. So our universe was hot. And uh, until uh, recombination epoch, which occurred uh, at redshift uh, 1090, uh, the uh, gas was ionized. There were protons and electrons separately. They interacted with photons. So all this system, baryons, photons, was one, uh, one and the same fluid. Okay? And there was also dark matter in the universe. Now, of course, there were perturbations both in uh, uh, baryons and in dark matter. And they started off as one of the same perturbations. Early on, perturbations of dark matter and baryons were sitting in one of the same place. So suppose there is over density in here. Okay? But, uh, Dark matter is non-interacting. Uh, there is no pressure. There is no uh, sound waves in dark matter. So uh, dark matter perturbation, dark matter over density stays here all the time. However, baryons and photons is uh, uh, has a lot of pressure, and therefore there are uh, over density in here. Eventually expands. Uh, making a sound wave, okay? So, baryons, over density in baryons, moved out from the over density in dark matter, okay? And uh, since we know pretty well the, uh, you know, the dynamics in the, in the uh, universe before recombination, we know this distance. That's essentially the uh, velocity of sound times this dt over a, that's the coordinate distance of t, that's the coordinate distance uh, that this wave traveled out. Could you please explain one more time what the velocity of what sound and what matter? Uh, well, we, I'm, I'm talking about uh, essentially photon gas with some admixture of variables. Okay? So uh, in the um, before recombination, that was one of the same, one of the same uh, fluid, okay? And uh, there was pressure of photons, right? The pressure of photons is equal to their energy density over three. That's the relativistic relationship between pressure and energy density. And the energy density was essentially equal to the energy density of the entire thing, the photons, okay? Photons were dominating over baryons until recombination. So, because of this, you have sound waves in this, in this gas <coughs> with the velocity of sound approximately equal to 1 over 2 over 3. Okay. That's the velocity of sound. So, there were sound waves there, and their velocity was, was this. This was relativistic, uh, relativistic plasma. Okay. So, both photons and baryons moved out from in the beginning to recombination, they travel this coordinate distance. Okay? And we can calculate it very precisely. Now, after recombination, baryons uh, and electrons combined into hydrogen atoms, and uh, they did not interact with photons any longer. So after recombination, they stayed here. Baryons stayed here. So you expect that there is a correlation between energy densities here, mass density here, which is due to dark matter, 
and energy density, mass density here, which is due to variance. Okay? And therefore, uh, you expect some correlation, some uh, peculiarity in the correlation function of matter in our universe, okay? of galaxies in particular. Because over density, both in variance and in dark matter, in the end, create galaxies. So the distance, this distance today is uh, the baryon acoustic oscillation distance is equal to 152 megapascals. Okay, that's the uh, commoving distance today of this uh, feature in the, in, the, in, the, in the spectrum, in the correlation function of galaxies, and that has been measured. And that's standard ruler, that's the important thing. You know, you have a standard ruler, you know the precisely the, the uh, distance. That's very useful for cosmology to know absolute distance, and absolute distance is here, okay? So this is the feature in the, uh, in the correlation function of galaxies, that's the first measurement, Today it's much more, much better known. That's a different, uh, you know, different scale. Uh, the measurement of this uh, correlation function is much more precise today. That's here. This is this feature, this enhancement of the correlation function. Uh, it's not quite 150 megaparsec, but that's because the units are rather funny units. H. Let me tell you that H by definition is the parameter characterizing our Hubble constant like this, uh, h times 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So h is the Hubble parameter in units of 100 kilometers per second uh, uh, per megaparsec, so h is about 0.7. What? What is alpha? Alpha? Where is alpha? Ah, that's technicality. That's, uh, you know, there are lots of technicalities in this business. But what is important is that one can measure oops, this, uh, the, uh, one can see this feature, and therefore, and actually this is, shows you uh, what people are doing today. They are, measuring the galaxy distribution over huge volumes, two gigaparsec cube, sorry, cube, two gigaparsec cube to infer this feature. Uh, and they extend the uh, redshift from 0.4 to 0.7. It's a huge part of the universe. Uh, well, what's, what's interesting and important is that you have standard ruler and using the standard ruler, you can measure the angle at which you see the standard ruler. And that again tells you uh, the relation between the redshift and, uh, and distance, right? You have a standard ruler. Therefore, you're measuring the angle, you measure also uh, the distance to this ruler. And you know the redshift. So uh, this is again measuring redshift uh, distance relation. It's called burning acoustic oscillations, or in Russian literature, it's sometimes called Sakharov oscillations, uh, because if you make a Fourier transformation of this correlation function, then you get uh, oscillating particle, which is shown here. So this is in Fourier space. This feature in correlation function shows up as oscillating pattern in the Fourier space. That's why it's called burning acoustic oscillations. And uh, uh, something non trivial happens from the point of view of observations. You see that there were uh, supernova observations and variant acoustic oscillations. They, they are very consistent with each other. Okay? Here is the plot. This is the Hubble parameter. This is the curvature of the universe. That's one of the plots. There are many plots like this. Here would be the measurement of this curvature versus Hubble parameter 
uh, by uh, cosmic microwave background alone. Okay, and you see, uh, cosmic microwave background is not particularly sensitive. However, if you look at the, uh, if you include also this uh, barrier acoustic oscillations, this is shown in, in this thread, then you really get very precise data, both on the Hubble parameter and curvature of the universe. Curvature is consistent with zero, you see, with, within maybe one or two percent. And this uh, <coughs> blue curve corresponds to uh, supernova data. So you see, that they are very consistent with each other. <coughs> and look, this is few percent scale, right? And this is few uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec scale in the Hubble problem. So now we are talking about very precise data. We know the Hubble parameter and curvature in this case very precise. All right, I think I stop here. Uh, so we, even without invoking uh, cosmic micro background data, we know a lot about the universe. We know its composition pretty well. Uh, we know its expansion rate pretty well. But of course, if you also include uh, cosmic micro background data, you do a lot better, and that will be discussed. We will discuss tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have a bit of a shift, but still we can have some questions, please. Uh, we know that uh, we need to have some infanton infoton field to run the inflation process and uh, it seems that Higgs field um, can uh, can do that. We can use Higgs field or like an infoton field. Well, I thought that, uh, I don't know, how can we do this? Because I thought that um, the, infl uh, the infoton, infoton field uh, should have really fine-tuned parameters, and they are different from the uh, Higgs field parameters. Right. The answer is twofold. Uh, one answer is that if you uh, if you think of the Higgs field as coupled to gravity in the minimal fashion, you write down its Lagrangian with gravity in the minimalistic way. It's called minimum coupling of uh, the scale of field to, uh, to gravity. Then you can't use it as an infoton because infoton needs to have very small coupling constant. Self-coupling must be tiny for the infoton if it is minimally coupled. And the, for, for the Higgs field, we know that it's not, it's not small at all. It's not uh, so this way you cannot do it. But if you allow yourself non-minimal couplings, in particular, you can write down, except for the usual kinetic term and uh, potential term, you can also write down a term like this, integral uh, scalar curvature times the, the scalar Higgs field squared, uh, g for x. That's perfectly allowed coupling between gravity this is uh, scalar curvature, and the Higgs field, okay? And if you also write here large coefficient, like 45,000, then you can do it. Then this term will drive inflation, not the potential of the Higgs field, but rather this term will drive inflation. And actually, this is a viable model. You, you get uh, predictions which are consistent with the data. So you can use the Higgs field but you have to equip it with a very large coupling to scalar curvature. Then you can do it. Okay. So, I think the question about this running lambda, this modern value of Higgs mass, when you run lambda to Planck mass, you get almost zero. This was this question. So uh, no, that's not enough. You have to fine tune much better. You have to fine tune much better. Not, it's not a matter of running. No. Wait, 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 they will do it. 
Now we can talk about that, but, but that would not work. You were told about the bigger map, and what about Plan? Well, Plan hasn't released the data yet, so <coughs> we don't know what does it see. Therefore, for the time being, the data are doubling the data. It's very interesting what Plan will say, what will measure. But for the time being, there is no even rumors. Can the Hubble constant, uh, Hubble parameter, uh, be dependent not only on time but also on some um, some variable like x or space, space spatial variable? Well, uh, that would be homogeneous universe. You you will need more matter there for the Hubble parameter to be different compared to Earth. Uh, in principle, there's, it could be, but on the one hand, inflation tells you that that should not happen. If you trust inflation, then uh, it's not an option. And also, there is no evidence for that. It would show up in the cosmic microwave background data uh, if the universe was you know, uh, inhomogeneous to the extent that the Hubble parameter will be, uh, will be different. But uh, CMB data do not support this at all. So it looks like the Hubble parameter, at least in the, our visible part of the universe, is all the same. Anyway.
shift very far away from 95 confidence level. Is uh, some uh, observational data, uh, any observational data, uh, inconsistent with uh, simple uh, lambda term and uh, Einstein equation? Uh, I would say no. For the time being, everything we know of is consistent with this five parameter, plus maybe two parameter uh, standard cosmological model. There are uh, anomalies here and there. I may be mentioning some of them in my last lecture. But whether these anomalies are real or whether these are you know, artifacts of uh, uh, you know, observations is not clear. So things we know for, for sure are consistent with uh, this five parameter. All right, thank you very much. I think we're about 95%.